So we have been going through the book of Judges, chapter by chapter, and it's been uh, thrilling. I love it, and I hope you do too. And it's an amazing book. You know, next week we're getting into Gideon, and God defeats people with jawbones, with trumpets, with uh, torches, with clay pots, with tent spikes. Like, here is this amazing book, you know, with short swords into the, uh, the fat man there, and just such a good book. So this uh, chapter, chapter 5 of the book of Judges, if you turn there, please, we're going to be looking at a duet of deliverance, where it's a song. It's like a psalm, but it's one of the ones found in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament here. And last week, we're looking at Deborah, looking at Barak, the commander of the, of the army there, and the children of Israel who joined to fight against Jabin, the king of Hazor, and Sisera, his commander. And his commander harshly oppressed the children of Israel for how long? 20 years of harsh oppression, 900 chariots of iron and a huge army. And, you know, then we get intro introduced. Sisera had to flee on foot. We got introduced to uh, Jael, Heber's wife, a Kenite. And we saw how, how Heber, this Kenite, was, uh, you know, for lack of better words, just a total flake. He, he was a traitor and he, he sided with Hazor, but his wife, did not. And she took that tent spike and she drove it through the skull of Sisera. And here is a, a song that erupts out of this great victory. It's a celebration and it, it's a praise to the Lord ultimately, but it, it, it talks about all of the different uh, people who were involved in the fight. And it even does talk also about the people who decided not to be involved in the fight. And ultimately, it is praise to the skull crusher, to the Lord Jesus, prophesied right in Genesis 3.15, that he would crush the skull or the head of the serpent. He is the serpent crusher, the skull crusher king. And he gives us victory over sin and death and judgment. So this duet of deliverance, though, does involve all those whom God used in it. Let's pray. Father, we do pray that you would bless us as we study this song of deliverance. And I thank you that you teach us and admonish us from the record in history. Lord, we don't want to be fools and, and repeat the foolish things of history. We want to learn and we want to be wise, not in our own eyes, but Lord, by submitting our hearts to you and trusting you, Lord, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do bless us as we study this chapter, Lord. Overlook my inadequacies as a man, and we pray for your grace and your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 5, verse 1 of Judges. Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, sang on that day. So here they are. Deborah, a prophetess, a judge. Some people would say Barak was a judge. He was obviously a military commander. Deborah was the one under the oak tree giving our terebinth or oak tree giving out the judgment. So I would say she was definitely a judge. And they sing this together. And it's commonly attributed to Deborah alone. She's not only a prophetess, she is a poetess and um, probably the better singer of the two. But together, they are way better than Sonny and Cher, way better than John and Yoko, or anybody, any other duo you can come up with. I really think, I, I love this chapter. They tear it up, and they really give praise to the Lord and um, focus on all, again, those who gave themselves to be part of it. It's similar to previous uh, songs. Exodus chapter 15, you know what happened right when after they crossed the Red Sea? The first thing recorded there after they crossed the Red Sea was that Moses and Miriam, they get out, they get out the tambourines, and they start worshiping God. They just start worshiping God after they cross the Red Sea. The horse and its rider have drowned into the sea. When David kills Goliath, and they, they, they bring home, he brings home the head of Goliath. He's got this gnarly giant head in his hand, and he's carrying it around, and all the women are out singing and dancing, and they're singing a song, and I think it's in 1 Samuel there, uh, 18. So there's these songs of deliverance. You know, we worship God, and we sing about the deliverance we have in Christ. We, 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 the gospel, what a reason to sing that we have. If anyone has a reason to sing, it's the believer in Jesus Christ. 
I'm going to keep singing. You know what's going to happen once we cro cross that threshold, the, the Jordan to come, the, the, when the veil is rent, we get to enter into that heavenly court, and we, we are there with the Lord bodily. We're going to sing and worship. That's what's going to happen. We are going to worship. We're going to bow down and praise the Lord, and it's going to be so awesome. And so we just keep rehearsing every week for that moment, that day. But yet, it's real when we praise God here and now, or when you're alone, or when you're in your vehicle, or when you're in a sh shower. Just turn on the music and just praise the Lord, or just make up a song and praise the Lord. Give God praise, because he's worthy. And I love how he's designed music to be part of that expression of our love back to him. There's joy and there's blessing in being a willing instrument of God. Here in verse 2, it says, When leaders lead in Israel... When the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. Right off the bat, she's, you know, they are singing, but they're saying, look, when leaders lead, bless the Lord. When the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. Leadership is important in any endeavor. In the Lord's work, it's also important. In Romans 12, it talks about some of the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives. And one is leadership. And it says, he who leads with diligence. That means you keep doing it. You keep going and you keep leading. Oh, but I'm feeling down this week. Get on your knees. Get some strength from the Lord. Find that fountain of grace and keep going. Keep going. And so when leaders lead and the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. God expects leaders among his people to lead. And leaders are nothing without the people. I once heard Ray Bentley, one of the pastors down at Maranatha Chapel in Sandy, outside of San Diego, and at a conference I was at, and he said, it's better in the King James. And he said, If any man leadeth and no one followeth, he merely taketh a walk. And I was like, Yeah, that's that's about right. <laughs> okay. You know? You know, it's it's job of leaders to lead, but it's the job of the people to willingly offer themselves. And we're all one body. It's not by compulsion, but it's willingly out of a cheerful heart. And it's it's willingly offering ourselves to the Lord, all of us, leaders and all. And when this occurs, God is praised. Bless the Lord. You know, Deborah had to encourage Barak in the previous chapter, chapter 4. She had to encourage him and say, Barak, you've been given a word from the Lord. You need to stand up and you need to go do it. De 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 Deborah, I don't want to go unless you go with me. Okay, I'll go with you, Barak. I'll hold your hand. And so they went. And God delivered. And it was awesome. And God built them all up. And, and Barak went, and he challenged others to come as well. And so the Lord is praised. It was said of Jesus' hometown that he couldn't do many miracles there. Why? Because of their unbelief. Because of their unbelief. But when everybody makes themselves available to the Lord, awesome things happen. God does a work. And he's looking for our availability. Availability. Making ourselves available. With humility. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. He's not looking for us to be some uh, arrived and then he uses us. No. He, he catches his fish, then he cleans them. He, he, he works with willing, humble, broken vessels. We'll see that in Gideon, definitely, with the broken clay pots. And God is praised. He just desires that we would yield ourselves, our hearts, to his will. Have no other gods before him. And when we do yield, our lives become that worship offering, and the Lord is praised. We see great things in everyone. But the leaders need to take the, the front step and lead in that. In verse 3 to 5, it recounts God's preservation of Israel. And remember, this is a song. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens poured, the clouds also poured water, the mountains gushed before the Lord, this Sinai before the Lord God of Israel. And it's recounting the history of what God has done, but yet linking it directly to the current day of what God is doing. God had brought them up miraculously from Egypt into the wilderness. God had, God had sustained them through the wilderness. And then God miraculously brought them across the Jordan. And then God miraculously had been giving them the land as they took the opportunity to yield to him in faith. And God is doing that again today. This is the same today. So it says, this Sinai 
in verse 5 at the end there, verse 5. This Sinai, today's work, today's work, this Red Sea, this Sinai, this Goliath, this victory that the Lord has as we have faith in him. And it looks like God sent heavy rainfall. It says the, the clouds poured water, the heavens poured, right? The mountains gushed before the Lord. Maybe as they were coming down Mount Tabor, and 10,000 against these 900 chariots of iron. Maybe as they, when they came down and they faced these 900 chariots of iron, they're like, how are we going to beat these guys? They've been oppressing us with their heavy tanks all day long. Their military is way bigger than ours. But if these mountains gushed and the rain poured and God sent that down, what do you think would happen to a heavy iron chariot? It gets stuck in the mud. And that could very well have been the way that victory was provided. It says back in chapter 4, verse 15, of judges and the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak and Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. The Lord did that. And I think partly possibly looking in the context of how the Lord did that was he sent heavy rainfall and these chariots probably got, I don't know exactly because it doesn't say that exactly, but that's pretty awesome. And they're singing about it. God was with us there, giving us the victory. We didn't know how it was going to happen. You know, we thought that the weather said it would be, you know, 41 and sunny all week. And then it just gushed, you know, just torrential rain. And they couldn't move. They were stuck. And we got that upper hand and we won. That was so awesome. Their tank became their tomb. You know, it's good for us to remember that God's goodness to us didn't just start today. God has been good to us, to you and me, for a long, long time. God saves you. God sustained you and kept you alive until that point. Who can testify to that? And then, that was miraculous. And then God has kept you, which is miraculous. And God is sanctifying you, which is miraculous because it's God's work. God will continue to preserve you and build you up and take you home to glory, to be with him and transition, translate you into a, a glorious body. Miraculous. It's good to remember the work he has done, is doing, and will do. In verse 6 to 8 of Judges 5, here's a description of life under Canaanite oppression. In the days of Shamgar, that was Shamgar in the ox code, chapter 3, verse 31. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were deserted and the travelers walked along the byways. You had to find a different route. You couldn't take the main roads because it was dangerous. You were oppressed. A people were oppressed. They had to sneak around and it wasn't busy. Village life, verse 7, ceased. It ceased in Israel. That's not good. Until I, Deborah, arose. Arose a mother in Israel. Verse 8, they chose new gods. Then there was war in the gates. That's the result of choosing new gods. Not a shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. The enemy had taken away their weapons. And you get this mournful, sullen note in the song. Quiet village life. It was, it was, they weren't able to go out on the roads. Unsafe, can't travel, fear of danger. The land is full of anarchy and confusion. They worship what they know not. The land was not in a good place of vibrancy in life. And life was hard under Israel's oppressors, but they, they got their, all their weapons confiscated and they couldn't even fight. Shamgar had to use an ox goad, a staff used for prodding oxen. You know, when, there's a spiritual analogy, al analogy in all of it. Satan doesn't just want to oppress the Christian. He wants to disarm the believer. He wants you to lay down your armor, which belongs to you in Jesus Christ. And says, until I, Deborah, arose, arose a mother in Israel. And she's not just, she's not being proud. She's, she understood that God works through willing individuals and she was willing. Verse nine is like the chorus of a song, a refrain is the older word for it. My heart is with the rulers of Israel who offered themselves willingly with the people. Bless the Lord. She's like, I have willingly offered myself and my heart is with those who offer themselves and the people who offer, willingly offer themselves. Bless the Lord. It's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing. And she had a heart for others who would do that. 
Her vision was bigger than just getting her personal life together. She wanted to see the kingdom of God advance. And back in verse 2, again, the people are to willingly offer themselves. But here, the leaders are to willingly offer themselves with the people. The leaders are also willingly offering themselves. It's not a job. It's a willing, you know, submission to the Lord, not a hireling. And Jesus, of course, willingly offered himself. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 to 7, it says this. Therefore, when he came into the world, that's Jesus, right? He said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. God wants you. He doesn't want your dime, your trinket, an hour. He wants your heart. He wants my heart. And when he has our hearts, he does great things. A body I've prepared for you to do your will. That's what Jesus said. And we follow in his likeness. And in Romans 12, 1, right, we present our lives a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, a reasonable act of our worship to him. And then you get to be in the will of God. It's a beautiful thing when our lives are surrendered. And, and not only individually, but as a body of believers prepared for him. That's awesome when that occurs. And God does works through the body. A time of Sunday is like a time of, of, of coming back into into a harbor and all the ships get to rest and they get their ropes refitted and they get the barnacles scrubbed and they get to be blessed and, and they get their tanks filled up with water and fuel again and their sails repaired and then they go back out into the world on the mission and then they come back in and then they go back out and then they come back in and, we, and we're building up the body of Christ presenting us at one another mature in Christ being built up into him so we come together in a safe fold and we get blessed and we worship and we learn of the Lord and sit at his feet. And then we go out and then we come back and it works that way. A church, a body in action, many individuals who are sold out to do his will. In verse 10 and 12 of Judges chapter 5, it speaks about the victory and it remembers it. Speak you who ride on white donkeys, who sit in judges' attire, who walk along the road far from the noise of the archers among the watering places. There they shall recount the righteous acts of the Lord, the righteous acts for his villagers in Israel. Then the people of the Lord shall go down to the gates. So this really contrasts the village life ceasing. Now it's talking about you don't have to hide where the archers are on the walls. You get to go out to the villages. And not only that, it's the people who are in leadership, in civic leadership, in spiritual leadership. They're going to be going out to those villages and they're going to tell them about the good things God has done. They're going to speak and recount the good things God has done. And leaders are to do that. Every leader is to share, and every leader uh, is to speak and recount the good things God has done. And everyone out in the highways and byways is to hear. In the book of Acts, we have the 120 disciples in the upper room praying, seeking, and worshiping God. And then what happened when the Holy Spirit came upon them? They went out to the streets, and then what happened? They started speaking in everyone's own languages. And what did they hear? Everyone heard in his own tongue the great works God has done. That's what they heard. They heard the great works God has done. And so when they're told here, you who are in judges' attire, you on white donkeys and so forth, go out and speak about the good works God has done. That hasn't changed. That's the move of the Holy Spirit, speaking about the works God has done. Speak, you who sit with, on white donkeys and judges' attire. You know, 2020 and 2021 are proving to be a time when God's leaders need to stand up and tell God's people the great things he has done, is doing, and will do. Speak, you who wear clergy robes. Speak, you who have influence and position. Speak, you who stand in pulpits. Stand up and tell God's people who they are and the high calling that we have. If a leader is too afraid or too worried to gather together with God's people, what do you think that does for the people? If a leader is too afraid to gather with the people, what do you think that does for the people? Many need to wake up and sing a song of praise to the Lord. We should never hide our light under a basket. This is the gospel and eternal souls we're talking about. We should be telling others the great things God has done. Oh, they'll hear through the internet. Some may, some do. But how blessed are the feet 
that share the good news. Now, the song of Deborah and Barak goes into this praise of those tribes who offered themselves, and it rebukes those who didn't. Then, in verse 13, the survivors came down. Oh, sorry, I skipped verse 12. Let's read that. Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake. Sing a song. Arise, Barak, and lead your captives away, O son of Abinoam. So another sort of refrain here and a beautiful little picture. In Psalm, I think it's 56, verse 7, it says, Awake, lute and harp, and sing. You know, sing to the dawn of the morning. Awake, dawn of the morning. It's a beautiful little picture there. I woke up this morning at 4.17 a.m., and I looked out the window, and it was the brightest red, deep, deep red, moving into orange, moving into green, yellow and green, and then blue. And the reason I woke up was not probably not just the rays of sun coming straight in at me. The birds were going bonkers. And, and I know this happens sometimes. It happens at the waking hours. And that really reminded me of, of that psalm. I was, it was so awesome to be able to wake up and then think about Psalm 56. Um, I'll find it right here. Verse 7, my heart is steadfast, O God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing you praise. Awake, my glory. Awake, lute and harp. I will awaken the dawn. Here's creation, awakening the dawn. Awakening the dawn with praise to God. I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations. For your mercy reaches unto the heavens and your truth unto the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. Psalm 56. So here you have in Judges 5.12, a similar thing. And they're calling, awake, awake, Deborah. She's calling herself, God help me, just awake. I want to, let's, let's be alive for Jesus. You know, awake, Barak. You ever say that to yourself? Get up, let's do this. I want to be awake for the Lord. Awake, you who sleep. And God will give you light. So, verse 13 and 14 now, uh, coming into the tribes that helped and the tribes that didn't here. Then the survivors came down, the people against the nobles. The Lord came down for me against the mighty. From Ephraim were those whose roots were in Amalek. Amalek, descendants of the giants. After you, Benjamin, with your peoples from Maker, rulers came down. And that's, Maker is part of Mecher, or however you want to say that. That's part of uh, Manasseh, West Manasseh, I believe. Um, and then, and from Zebulun, those who bear the recruiter's staff. So, it begins with the Lord came down for me against the mighty. Nine tribes are mentioned. Some joined, others didn't. God used those who did, and he, they were stirred to join the battle. And that's Ephraim, Benjamin, East Manasseh, uh, Zebulun, and Issachar. And then verse 15, it says, I love this verse. The princes of Issachar were with Deborah. And Issachar, as Issachar, so is Barak with Deborah, sent into the valley under his command. Among the divisions of Reuben, there were great resolves of heart. Great resolves of heart. I love that. that is a, that's very uh, poignant. In verse 16, the rebuke begins, Why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear the pipings for the flock? Flocks. The divisions of Reuben have great searchings of heart. So it's contrasting those who would sit by their sheep and just listen to the pipings and be like, no, 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 not going to that battle. And it contrasts the Reubenites who had great searchings of heart. In verse 17, it says, Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. And why did Dan remain on ships? Asher continued at the seashore and stayed by his inlets. So it mentions these three tribes who didn't join. And look at the contrast with verse 18. Zebulun is a people who jeopardized their lives to the point of death. Naphtali also on the heights of the battlefield. So this contrast of Gilead, Gilead is East Manasseh. So Manasseh is the tribe that's split into two, East and West. So you have West Manasseh joined. Uh, oh, no, wait, I have East Manasseh written for both. Sorry, someone else can figure that out. But half of Manasseh joined, half of Manasseh didn't. Dan and Asher uh, did not join. And then Zebulun, it speaks about Zebulun and Naphtali. And they're actually shamed in the song. That's kind of crazy, you know. Surely they had reasons. You know, let me first go bury my father. Uh, let, me, let me first go take care of this, this business. Uh, you know, I got to go mend my nets because the season's coming up. 
Mm. Let me go get this matter settled. Then I'll seek the kingdom first. Then I'll be part of the battle. Then I'll commit myself to the Lord's work and offer myself freely. No, you won't. No, you won't. What do you mean? Well, if you're already seeking something else first, you're not going to be seeking the kingdom first. It'll be second. It's just natural math. And I'm not here to rebuke you, but, you know, you came out on a hot day, and here we are outside, etc. And yet, we are called to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek first. The, what does that mean? We should study that, search it out, and, and not be a then Christian. Then I'll follow the Lord. Once I get this, then I will. How about instead of let me first, then I will, how about I simply seek the kingdom first, not second? Well, I'm still bound to this or that, you know, I'm still, I just can't right now. We can only serve one master, and he who is in the sun is free. He who the sun sets free is free. And even if someone was in a place of being a, a slave to a master, like in the Roman, Roman system, they didn't say, you need to rebel, you need to get free from that so you can go serve God. You know what they were counseled to do? Serve God as a slave. Serve him under the servitude that you're in and the house that you're in. And many of Caesar's household came to Christ. I wonder how that happened. We can serve God wherever we're at. Whatever job we have, whatever place we're in, it's just a matter of our soul and our spirit making that call and decision. Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its lusts and passions and desires. So it's a spiritual thing first and foremost. It's not about a physical thing so much. That's a response to what is going on in the spirit. We can all seek the Lord. Meanwhile, Zebulun, here he is, a people who jeopardized their lives to the point of death, also Naphtali on the heights of the battlefield. And the story of the Christian church is full of the rich history of those who loved not their lives to the death, who forsook all and by faith followed and obeyed. Barak is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith. I think it's Hebrews 11:32. He was one of those who did offer himself. He had, he had difficulty making that decision, but he made it. And he was recorded in the Hall of Faith. Reuben had difficulty making that decision. Reuben had great searchings of heart. But Reuben made the decision. Now, the battle is described and a curse is given on an unhelpful city, Miraz, in verse 19 through 23. Then the kings came and fought the kings of Canaan fought in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo, down in the valley there. They took no spoils of silver. They weren't there to, to get something for themselves. They were there for deliverance. They were there for freedom. That's why they were there at this fight. They fought from the heavens. The stars from their courses fought against Sisera. Now, you could take this to be the angels joined in the fight and very well likely <laughs> occurred. But also, you could take it to understand that the water poured down from the heavens also. But it mentions stars there. Well, God intertwines the spiritual and physical, doesn't he? The word eternal God became flesh and dwelt among us, forever entwining the physical and spiritual. The torrent of Kishon swept them away. Kishon is the, is the stream that flows through the Megiddo Valley. Okay, so there was this rain that poured in there. My soul marched on in strength. They were like, this is awesome. Imagine getting into a position where you feel it. You are the underdog. You don't feel it. You're looking at it and you are, but you have the Lord and his command and his promise. A prophecy was given to Barak from Deborah. And, and then you're like, I don't know how this is going to happen. I have no idea unless or but God. And then boom, the, the thunder cracks and the rain pours down and it's coming down the valley into the Kishon stream, just flooding and those chariots are getting turned over and stuck and it's just awesome. So cool. The horses, then the horses, verse 22, hooves pounded, the galloping, galloping of his steeds. They didn't know what to do. They were stuck. Curse Miraz said the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is mentioned 80 times in the Old Testament. Over 20 of them are in the book of Judges. 
I believe that to be Jesus, the angel of the Lord. Curse, here's what he said, curse its inhabitants bitterly because they did not come to help the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. So they were called to come. Can't get in trouble for not, you know, obeying something that you don't know you were supposed to do at all. But here they were called to come. They didn't go. They didn't go to that. God doesn't need help, but he involves our participation in things. So Miraz did not join. And, and it wasn't to their benefit at all. It ended up being to their consequence. And now it goes into an individual, most blessed individual. Verse 24, among women is Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. <laughs> blessed is she among women in tents. <laughs> he asked for water. She gave him milk. She brought out cream in a lordly bowl. She stretched her hand to the tent peg, her right hand to the workman's hammer. She pounded Sisera. She pierced his head. She split and struck through his temple. At her feet he sank. He fell. He lay still. At her feet he sank. He fell. Where he sank, there he fell dead. It's amazing. Now the contrast goes into Sisera's mother in the next verse, but let's hang on Jael and what she did here just for another minute. It's amazing. Most blessed among women. She was so blessed in her obedience. Now the common responsibility in the ancient Middle East was to protect anybody that came into your tent. You are their host and you must protect them, be they enemies or no. You must protect them. Yet Jael killed a guest and she is praised for it, most blessed for it. Because this guest was the enemy of the Lord. Again, his name means battle array, battle array against God. And at her feet, he sank. G. Campbell Morgan, one of the greatest historical preachers says, quote, finally, the song rejoiced over the death of the tyrant in language that thrills with Eastern imagery and color. And Poole said this, here is a lively representation of the thing done. At the first blow or wound, he was awakened and made some attempt to rise. But being astonished and very weak, she followed through with her first blow with others and found he found himself impotent and fell down dead. And we don't know exactly how that went about, but the, the imagine, you can see the imagination of these preachers and commentators is running with it. You're like, okay, now how did this work? And some people read chapter four and they're like, that contradicts chapter five. It doesn't contradict at all. It's just a more thorough explaining of what occurred with the milk and so forth and the blank blanket is in chapter four. There's no blanket in chapter five. It's fine. And so forth. But she hosted him and she wooed him in there and then boom, she wasn't going to stand on guard, guard for him. But driving that tent peg down and it staked into the ground, chapter four told us. She had serious conviction to do this, to go against her husband's wishes and to go against her culture's wishes. She did it. Conviction. We need conviction, not guilt. We've messed up the terms. Conviction and guilt are different things. And if I say, do you believe in prayer? You say, yeah, I believe in prayer. Do you pray? No, I don't pray. Then you don't have a conviction about prayer. Do you believe in prayer? Yeah, I believe in prayer. Do you pray? Yes, I pray. I'd like to pray more, but I pray. Then you have a conviction about prayer. She had convictions, and the convictions allowed her to take steps of faith when other things would tell her otherwise. It's belief that acts. Guilt's a poor motivator. But when we know and we say this is real, and God's grace and love convicts our hearts, serious conviction is going to take sin to the cross where Jesus took that nail. And it's beautiful and rightful praise here to J.L., who is a skull crusher, but a foreshadow of Jesus, who is the skull crusher. And what's the result of all this? Sisera does not get to go home. He was an abuser and plunderer of good. And this destroyer did not get to go home. Verse 28, the mother of Sisera looked through the window and cried out through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarries the clatter of his chariots? Because they're stuck in the mud, lady. Her wisest ladies answered her. Yes, she had answered herself. They knew. They knew the demise. Are they not finding and dividing the spoil? They're trying to come up with, oh, they're just reveling in their spoil. Oh, what's their spoil? 
verse 30, to every man a girl or two. Oh, sex trafficking. That's literally what it is. To every man a girl or two. For Sisera, plunderer of dyed garments, plunderer of garments embroidered and dyed, two pieces of dyed embroidery for the neck of the looter. This culture was okay with such evil. They weren't doing anything about it. Anybody that wanted to talk against it, they might just censor them. But here they are, trying to imagine what it might be like for the mother of Sisera, trying to imagine what it be, might be like for those back in the hometown, the woodland of the nations, it was called, remember? And they're like, they're not coming. Those plunders, spoilers, destroyers of life and young girls. And then verse 31, Thus let all your enemies perish, O Lord, but let those who love him be like the sun when it comes out in full strength. Doesn't it remind you of Daniel? Those who do righteous deeds will be like the sun and you're going to shine as the stars in righteousness. Excuse me. Let those who love him be like the sun when it comes out in full strength. So these guys were disappointed. The abusing time is over. And surely the victory that the cross brings and gives is, is a deliverance from a Sisera, from sin, from its oppression, from those chariots of iron and so forth. And to love God is also to hate the things he hates. And if the world is so much your friend and never your enemy, that may not be a compliment. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Who defines what love is? God already has. God is love. And let those who love him be like the sun, shining out, coming out on its full strength. God has an inner strength for us that can stand, that can fight, that can move forward in the things the Lord has for us. We don't have to be um, hiding and so forth, but we can be strong in him. You know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can be weak through Christ who strengthens me. I can abound through Christ who strengthens me. I can be content through Christ who strengthens me. I don't need the gods of this world because I have Christ who strengthens me. Lord, we thank you that you do call us to walk with you. You call us to follow you. You call us to stand and having done all to stand. You call us to take up the armor to adorn ourselves with the salvation that we have in you, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, the shoes of the gospel. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've given us. We thank you, Jesus, that you're for us and that you are the captain of our salvation. Lord, we don't want to make up some fight to fight. We don't want to beat the air. Lord, if we're going to fight, we want to land those hits. So teach us. Help us to follow you, Lord. Help us to pray as we ought. Help us to seek you, Lord. Jesus, as you stir our hearts, we just want to be thankful again for your mercy to us, for your grace for us, Jesus, that you are the leader. You're the one who goes before us. You do lead and we follow. We thank you so much, Jesus, for being our leader. We thank you that, Lord, you give us such hope and assurance and encouragements. And as, Lord, out of looking at you, we pray that you build conviction in our hearts, in our lives, so that we can stand and fight. Lord, so that we can pray, so that we can enter your throne of grace. God, I thank you for your church. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I thank you for the good works you're doing. I thank you for the missionaries that are here, Lord. I thank you for those that are giving up their life to you, and I pray your abundant blessing upon them, that you would go before them in every which way, that you would provide for them, that you would show them great things you're going to do, Lord Jesus. Father, let us understand what to do as far as borders are concerned and any travel that needs, needs are there. But Lord Jesus, we just, we love you and we thank you that you have good works prepared before and for us to walk in and we want to walk in those. Help us to see the need of the hour and help us to fight the good fight of faith. In Jesus' name, amen.